Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another vinyl update and today I'm going to show you records all of which were purchased from my local market traders Heightside Records, West Yorkshire based. They come to Lancaster once a weekend and I often go down there on a Saturday. Got some really tremendous things from um, Robin and his dad uh, which I've been collecting over the last few weeks so I uh, thought I would uh, keep you up to date with what's been happening. So this one is just fresh off the racks, just come back from town now having picked this up. Found this in um, Robin's silver box of new arrivals and I just flipped my lid when I saw it because I never see this band's records out in the wild so get a load of that. We've got the Pixies and Bossa Nova which is their, oh god, third, fourth album and um, yeah, I mean, the Pixies is a band that you just never, I never see them about. I would even go so far as to say I don't think I've ever seen an original Pixies album in the wild. So, really, really chuffed to find, to find this. There's the inner. And um, I've got all the Pixies on CD. I uh, never had them on, on record. So, uh, that has made my morning, my afternoon rather. There's the label for that. So, yeah, superb. Pixies, a band I've been listening to off and on for many years and um, just really chuffed to get that. So, Robin did mention he's got a copy, I think he's got a copy of Bossa Nova, which maybe hasn't been put out on the on display yet, but maybe that'll be there next weekend when I go. But anyway, yeah, Pixies, Bossa Nova, first find of the video and only find of today. Now, these go back um, maybe two or three weeks. So there's some really splendid stuff here, including some, um, I know I'm not allowed to use the word grails, but they are sort of semi-grails, you know, records that I've been looking for for years and years. This one's not a grail, but at the same time it's not a record I've seen around the place particularly. Uh, two, two albums by this band actually, and the second one is the sort of graily one, but uh, let's start with this one first. This is The Water Boys and their debut album, which is just called The Water Boys, I think, yeah. Really nice condition. This was a good price. Uh, what year was this? Chrysalis, uh, 1982. Uh, so the Water Boys, obviously Mike Scott, uh, folk, rock, indie kind of sound. One of the bands that really defined my college years, really. And uh, this is uh, Chicken Jazz. I've never actually heard the um, Water Boys debut album, so uh, I'm looking forward to spinning this one. I've given this one a clean. I uh, haven't listened to it yet, uh, but... Um, Yes, really chuffed to get that. Water Boys debut. And this one I have played, and you can probably guess which one it is when I say it's the Grayley one. The Water Boys, um, their classic album. I've been looking for a copy of it for literally years. Never seen one. Or uh, maybe I've seen them, but they've been just not very well priced, you know. This one was, I think this was a tenor, which was... Um, I was more than happy to pay for uh, for this because it's uh, just a classic album. Fisherman's Blues in really, really nice condition. Bring it around that side. And um, there's the band on the cover there. Lovely back cover to this record. Lovely, uh, beautiful rural scene there. And what a classic album. I mean, side two, the first track on side two and a bang on the ear. Just one of those beautiful, timeless songs. When Will We Be Married? Mike Scott is a great, great lyricist. And, um, you know, he's he's a songwriter that I've followed for many years, but uh, I've always had this sort of sneaking suspicion that I've not delved deep enough into his works, really. I've never really heard much of his um, solo material. But uh, anyway, so pleased to get this. This is just a classic British um, roots rock album, really. And um, I think this was after Carl Wallinger had left the band the guy that went on to form World Party. He gets a thank you on the back, but he's not in the line up there. No, I can't see him on the cover. But uh, yeah, the Water Boys, Fisherman's Blues, been after it for so long, so really chuffed to find a copy of that. Try that side again. I've got a bit of a glare on that side, but it's a better overall light, I think, somehow. Um, yeah, Water Boys, top stuff. Right, this next one, a band that I had heard of and I'd heard I'd never heard their music, but there's one there's one song of theirs which I have heard, courtesy of a cover by um, Robert Plant. And I've seen this record shown a couple of times uh, on the VC over the years. So when I saw it, I thought, ooh, I do recognise that record. And I think I will pick it up because it was a good price. And it is... Uh, 
better that side, isn't it? Um, this is the Youngbloods, who were an American rock band from New York back in the 1960s. Don't think they had too much commercial success. Uh, the song that Robert Plant covers on one of his records, I think it's the album he did, he did an album of covers a few years back, and he covered, um, it was the opening song on this album actually, Darkness, Darkness, a very faithful version actually. Um, not quite sure what Robert's connection to the Young Bloods um, is, really. And I don't know too much about these guys. If anybody's got any any information, I have read up on them a little bit, but I'm not going to bore you with uh, Wikipedia notes or anything. But um, this is a really nice album. Quite hard to categorise, really. I guess there's a bit of folk in there, a bit of rock and roll, maybe a little tinge of psych, um, just some really nice songs. Um, so, yeah, just on... Orange RCA, but anyway, yes, the Young Bloods, and that is their debut record, I think, from um, 1960 something. They're not going to put it on. Oh yes, they are. 1969 on um, RCA. Okay, so this next one, again, I was really chuffed to find it. I would be listening to this record quite recently on CD and remarking to myself how great it is, and I saw Rob Ison showing a different record by them, and then at Heightside a few weeks back, I stumbled uh, into the path of the vinyl version of Real Life by Magazine, and this is an original British pressing, very, very hard to come by, and um, I think it was only a tenor, John Leckie production from 1978. Um, Howard Devoto, of course, the guy who'd been in the Buzzcocks originally, but he left quite soon. This is, you know, essentially this is the sound of post-punk. If you want to know what post-punk is, um, listen to this album. Um, sort of a little bit like Gary Newman, I suppose, that kind of early classic kind of dark synth-based sound, well, guitars and synth, really. Very ominous sounding, but just really great pop hooks. Even though it's dark, there's a sort of poppiness to it. Howard Devoto's vocals are extremely distinctive. Where is the great man? There he is there on this side. And, um, yeah, Dave Formula on keyboards. There's a name. Just a great, great record. John, uh, a John Leckie production. Let's have a look inside. On the classic uh, Blue Virgin label. So, um, yeah, again, it's just not a band that you see around the place. This is a record. When I first discovered the VC many years ago, I saw a couple of people showing this record, and I remember thinking, wow, it would be fantastic to get that on vinyl. So, um, delighted to, uh, to say that uh, I now have got it. So, superb. Yeah, magazine, real life. And then this one... I've not clapped eyes on a copy of this record, I don't think, since I was about 19. When I was a student, um, living in a shared house, my housemate had this record, and I knew nothing about it. I don't even remember listening to it back in the day, but it was had a very distinctive cover. Years later, I picked up a couple of the band's other records, and I really enjoyed them, but I'd never seen this one. And this is The House of Love, and it is, uh, it's not their debut album. Uh, I think it's their third record. Um, I think the first album was also called The House of Love, but um, this one's known as The Butterfly Album, and you can, you can see why that might be the case. Um, Ross Goodall, uh, here on the VC, is a big fan of this bunch. Um, Guy Chadwick, their singer-songwriter, and um, yeah, it's just what you describe as classic British indie music, really, from the 1980s. Quite sort of 60s derived, just seeing the date here, this was actually 1990, this one, but I sort of think of them as being an 80s band, presumably because they started in the 80s. And we've got a very fetching um, display of butterflies going on. So uh, let's have a look and see where we're at with the label, just on black um, Fontana. Oops. Um, yeah, so um, again, at the risk of repeating myself, it's a record I've been looking for for a long time and uh, great to have it in the collection at last. So the House of Love debut uh, from 1990. Somebody who produced that? Don't actually know. You can look it up. Uh, and then this one, another one that I've been looking for. Uh, not really a grail record, but it's one that I wanted to complete the collection because um, I've got the first, two, the first two albums by this band before they changed their singer. This was the... I think this was the third one um, before John Fox um, left Ultravox. Systems of Romance and um, uh, yeah, the third the third Ultravox album when it was still John Fox. The, so the pre the pre Mick Midge Mick Midge era. 
so um, this was a bit of a transitional record for them. When you know when Ultravox started with the exclamation mark, they were a bit of a punk band really, and then. Um, they started to get a bit more synthy, and I think this record is known as the one where the synths start to creep into the picture more decisively, and they start to gradually morph into the Ultravox that we uh, that would later go on to have huge fame and success with Midyear in the band. But um, yeah, interesting record, interesting sound. I'm going to do an Ultravox collection special at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future. So I won't uh, I won't ramble on too much about it here and now. But this one is on the beautiful Blue Island label and um, I don't think did they, I'm not sure they stayed with Island, I've got a feeling that they lost their deal with Island and then kind of broke up and then mid joined them and it all went off into a different direction really. I'm a bit of a fan of the mid Ultravox as well, they get a bit of a raw deal really. It's kind of cool to say you like the John Fox era and not cool to say that you like the mid era but I've always, I mean I you know, I love, I love Vienna, it's one of the greatest pop singles of all time uh, in my book so um, yeah good stuff Ultravox uh, Island Records from do we get a date on this one let's have a look and see I'm going to guess around about 1979 1978 one year out as Kim Bruce says here in the UK on the radio uh, yeah Ultravox Systems of Romance so the final two this will raise an eyebrow in some quarters long-term viewers to my channel will know that I've always said I don't like this band or I didn't like them anyway and then I started listening to them I've got a friend of mine who's really into them he started playing me their stuff and I started to clue into it and I thought to myself you know what it, it's really really not very clever still um, harboring all the weird resentments I had about them. I'm not going to go into it now, but you know, suffice it to say that I have cracked it with REM, and and not just am I enjoying their music, but I think I would now say I'm actually a fan, a fan of their music, really. So, um, the only the only vinyl one I've got that I had so far was Fables of the Reconstruction, which I think is their third album. This is Document, and this is their fifth album. The Five gives it away. I think this is their fifth. And I'm going to say this was the last one that they released as an indie band, or am I totally wrong about that? Uh, I know they started on IRS, didn't they? Let's have a look. This was the one where their sound really started to get quite um, sort of mainstream, as far as mainstream, as far as REM got mainstream. They were quite a clever band, really, because they managed to retain that um, classic college rock sound while also sort of sounding like a stadium rock band. Bit of a clever conjuring trick that they pulled there yeah this one's on um, IRS finest work song kicks off side one uh, you've got disturbance at the heron house which is a great song and it's the end of the world as we know it is uh, 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 is the big track off this album great record nice to have it still looking for um, the first two still looking for um, murmur and reckoning and Life's Rich Pageant, but I'm not looking for any longer this one. So this, I think this is the first album that they did on uh, Warners. Uh, this is Green. Now this is the album that was just, when I went to uni in 89, you could not get away from, uh, the, well, the, the two big singles from this record were um, Stand and Orange Crush in particular was a really big song in the nightclubs of Lancaster here back in 1989, 1990. It was a song that was just... It was rammed down your throat a little bit. I mean, that was the objection that I always had with R.E.M. back in the day, was that they were so ubiquitous. After this album, when they did Out of Time, you really couldn't escape them, you know. But uh, listening to this again now at this distance, it just sounds tremendous. I mean, both those copies are really, really nice sounding, really, really clean, really beautiful, and um, just, just great to get. So let me show you what we've got. Just got the inner here. And then the record itself, will, I'm guessing, will just be on a dull... Oh, no, it's not on a dull Warner's label. It's actually on quite a nice custom, orange custom label there. So, um, yeah, there we go, R.E.M. Who would have thought it? Um, at some point, I'll try and do a favourite 20 or a favourite 10 R.E.M. songs. Just need a bit more time with them first, but... Uh, yeah, I'm pleased I finally cracked them anyway, because they are a great band, and they were they were so much a part of what was happening back in the 80s and 90s, really, that it uh, it just seems strange to uh, to not have them in the collection. So there we go. That is my Heightside Records update, and um, 
The next update I probably do will be showing some stuff I picked up at um, Moonlight Records in Wrexham again. So in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed the selection and uh, I'll see you in the next one.